Hi everyone, I wonder, have you ever been driving on a main road when suddenly Waze tells you to turn off and to take a back route to go down a smaller, quieter road? What do you do in that moment? Do you obey and take the turning? Or do you think, well, I, I roughly know where I'm heading. I think I'll stay on the main highway. And likewise, I wonder, have you ever felt prompted by God to take an alternative route in life? Maybe switching jobs or changing circumstances and moving from something that looks successful or straightforward in life to do something a little less obvious. During these last two years, I think many people have reassessed what they want or where they're going in life. Many people have changed jobs or changed circumstances or had change thrust upon them. Maybe you can relate to that. So what do we do? Do we change course? How do we know if it's God prompting us to change and it's his plan for our lives or, or is it just our own imagination? My talk today is entitled, The Road Less Traveled. The reading is taken from Acts chapter eight, verses 26 to 40. And before I begin to unpack it, let me just read it to you. And as I read, allow the Holy Spirit, allow the Bible passage itself just to speak to you. So this is Acts chapter eight, beginning verse 36. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. At the start of Acts chapter eight, a few verses earlier, we read how persecution had broken out against the first church in Jerusalem, and it forced the Christians to disperse amongst the surrounding areas. The apostle Philip ends up in a city called Samaria and a mass movement of God, a successful revival breaks out in that city with lots of people there being healed, set free and coming to faith. Philip, in other words, is busy in something hugely successful, a revival. But suddenly God, through an angel, tells him to change course, to change direction and to set out and take the quiet desert road heading south to Gaza. Philip immediately obeys, upon which the Holy Spirit tells him to stay close to a chariot that's on the road. In that chariot was an Ethiopian eunuch, uh, an important official in the treasury of Queen Candace in the kingdom of Cush, which spanned modern day Sudan and Ethiopia. 
The eunuch is reading from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8, which is about the one who is led like a sheep to the slaughter. And Philip begins a conversation with the eunuch, explaining how this passage of scripture is referring to the saving sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And he shares the good news with him. When they come to some water, the eunuch asks to be baptized, which Philip does before he's taken away miraculously by the spirit and the Ethiopian goes on his way rejoicing. What an amazing passage. What an extraordinary story. What does it tell us about taking the road less traveled? The first is this, obey the Lord. Even if it seems he's asking you to leave something fruitful and to take the road less traveled. The conversation with this Ethiopian was very significant. He may well have been the first Gentile, the first non-Jew to convert to Christianity. Even before the Roman Cornelius and his household later in Acts chapter 10, the early church believed that the conversion of this Ethiopian man was the beginning of the fulfillment of Psalm 68, 31, which declared that the kingdom of Cush would submit to the Lord. They believed this treasurer returned to his home nation to preach the gospel in Cush, and as a result began what eventually became the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which today has over 36 million people in it. And he was probably the first person to take the gospel to the continent of Africa. Today, there are more Christians alive in Africa than any other continent on the planet. So in other words, this ended up being one of the most successful conversations for the spread of the gospel ever in history. But at the time, it must have looked and felt like a serious diversion or detour for Philip. It had meant that Philip had to give up and leave what had been the most fruitful thing in his ministry and his life up until that point, a revival in Samaria. And then take this quiet desert road leading to nowhere. In other words, you can trust that Jesus sees the bigger picture for your life, even when you can't. Now, you might say, yes, but how do I know if it is God telling me to take the road less traveled, or whether it's my own imagination or thoughts. Well, I, I want to say this to you. You can relax. You are not going to miss it. If it is from God, he will make it really clear. You know, just this past week, I, I was driving somewhere using Waze, and it seemed like Waze had stopped talking to me. I wanted ways to tell me whether I was still on the right track or if I had to turn as I, I didn't really know where I was going. So I, I checked the 4G connection on my phone. I, I checked the speakers. I, I tried to see uh, if the connection was still intact. But then I looked again and I saw that I still had another 10 kilometers to go on the same road before the next turning. You see, if it seems like God is silent, or he's not speaking to you right now, or he's not answering your questions about direction in life or a decision, well, that doesn't mean that you've lost connection with him. It might mean just keep going in the same direction, keep going on the same road. And of course, when I got within a few hundred meters of my next turn on that journey, guess what? Ways started talking to me again and got me ready. When it's time to turn, God will let you know. So for Philip, we're told that God sent an angel to get him to leave Samaria, to leave the revival and to take the road less traveled towards Gaza. We also later learned that other leaders of the church took his place in Samaria and the amazing work of God continued. But at the time, taking this road to Gaza for Philip must have felt a bit odd because there wasn't really any traffic on that road. Nobody really took that desert road. But Philip obeyed. Why? Because it was so obviously God telling him to do it. 
He sent an angel. Now, God might not send you or me an angel, but I believe he will make it clear. And the more drastic the change, the more important the turn to take, the clearer it will be. You know, back in the uh, year 2000, I was really wrestling with this question. Should I stay in my job in industry or should I change direction, leave it and go and train for ordination to become a pastor? And, um, you know, how did I wrestle with this question? Well, I was certainly praying about it. I was reading scripture. I was seeking the counsel and wisdom of others. But God very graciously then gave me a clear sign. Sarah and I, um, in our spare time, used to help with the youth group at the church that we went to. And we'd taken some of these teenagers uh, on a short-term mission trip to Tamil Nadu in the south of India. We were, we were helping um, uh, build a, a farm uh, to give jobs for kids with uh, learning and physical disabilities. And whilst we were there, uh, we got invited to go and have tea with the Bishop of Tiranaveli. Now, we'd never met him. He didn't know anything about us. And when we turned up at his, his house, he graciously opened the door and greeted us as we all walked in. I was the last one to walk in. As I shook his hand, he held it, looked in my eyes, seemed to be listening to God, and then said, wait a moment. He went into a side room and he came back with a stole, a, a clergy scarf, and he put it round my neck and said, receive this scarf. It's a sign of the priestly calling on your life. I was like, wow, God, that was pretty clear. Thank you. You see, I believe God will also make it clear to you if he wants you to change direction. That's on him. But when he does, it's then on us to obey and to turn, obey him. The second thing we see in this passage is that Jesus is the key who unlocks scripture and who opens the eyes of the spiritually blind. It was only when the good news of Jesus was explained that the, that the Ethiopian could fully comprehend the words of the prophet Isaiah that he was reading. Jesus, in other words, is the lens through which we must read the Bible. And he is the one that we must proclaim when we share our faith. The whole of scripture is about him. The whole of scripture points us to Jesus. Jesus actually said this himself in John chapter five. He said to the Pharisees, you study the scriptures di diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. And maybe a good analogy is this. Um, at night when we get into bed, when Sarah gets into bed, she puts on her reading glasses, turns on her bedside light, and then starts reading her book. And likewise, we need two things when we come to read the Bible. The first thing we need is we need to put on the lens of Jesus, to read it through the lens of Jesus, realize that it points us to him, both the Old Testament and the New. But the second thing we need is the light of the Holy Spirit, to ask the Spirit of God to open our hearts and our minds to truly understand the text and how it points us to Christ. It was D.L. Moody who said, trying to read the Bible without the Holy Spirit was like trying to read a sundial at night. So as you open your Bible or open your Bible app on your phone, just pray a simple prayer. Ask the Spirit to come, to open up our understanding, our eyes, to read the scriptures with faith and to see how it points us to Jesus and you'll really reap the benefit and you'll hear the voice of God and it'll help you make those decisions about direction in life. Do you know in Isaiah chapter 31 verse four, it talks of uh, how as a lion growls over its prey. That word for growl there is in Hebrew is hagar. 
It's the same word used in Psalm 1 when it talks about the person who meditates, Hagar, over the law of the Lord, over the law of God, scripture. In other words, in Psalm 1, the meaning is more than just meditate, like we don't just mm, think about scripture. But as uh, we uh, ask the Spirit to open up the scriptures to us, like a lion, we will chew on the word of God. We will digest and be fed by the word of God and we will growl and purr in delight and God will show us the way. The third thing we see in this passage is that when we become more like Jesus, we end up doing things for Jesus and we do the sort of things that Jesus did. The book of Acts was written by Luke and Luke also wrote, unsurprisingly, the gospel of Luke. And this story about Philip here in Acts chapter eight has a lot of parallels with another story that Luke recorded in uh, Luke chapter 24 about Jesus on the road to Emmaus. You see, in Luke chapter 24, Jesus walks with two disciples on the quiet road to Emmaus. And here in Acts 8, Philip is with the Ethiopian on the quiet road to Gaza. In Luke 24, Jesus explains how all scriptures are about him, the Messiah. The disciples later say, weren't our hearts burning within us as he opened up the scriptures to us? And here in Acts 8, Philip explains how Isaiah 53 is all about Jesus, the Messiah. On the road to Emmaus, Jesus then shares a sacrament with the disciples. He breaks bread. And here in Acts 8, Philip baptizes the Ethiopian, baptism being the other sacrament. And both Jesus and Philip are then miraculously taken away at the end of the stories by the Spirit. In other words, we see that Philip is now doing the sort of things that Jesus did. So I want you to be encouraged. As you obey and take the road less traveled, not only will, you, will the Lord have significant things for you to do, but in so doing, you will become more like Christ and do the things that he did. You know, today, this service, we, we've been calling it the Big Serve. It's an opportunity for each one of us to play our part in seeing the kingdom of God advance and uh, the church built. And if you'd love to know more about all the teams and all the ways in which you can serve, then just click on the link here on the web page uh, uh, to find out more. And I'm going to be honest, we need you. Only together can we see vision become reality to play our part in the evangelization of the nations. You know, we're also the hub for Alpha and Asia Pacific to see the revitalization of the church, to see the church grow and other churches be planted and to see the transformation of society. All the good we do in the community, like the food bank and the marriage courses and everything else that goes on, changing one life at a time, we need you. So if, for example, you think, yeah, I'll join the hosting team and welcome people to church. Remember that Jesus said in welcoming strangers in love, many people unknowingly have welcomed angels. Or if you join the prayer team, remember that Jesus too, he often laid hands on people and prayed for them. If you join the cafe team, remember that Jesus too served the 5,000, feeding them. If you join the CHTBB, team, the children's team. Remember Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And if you volunteer to be Bintang Bear, remember Jesus said that he would bear our sins. Okay, bit tenuous, okay, apologize. But whatever you choose to do, maybe the worship and production team or, or however, know that you're doing the work of Jesus. We are his hands and feet. And as we choose to follow him as disciples, as we grow more like him, then we will do what he did. And in so doing, see the kingdom advance in our time. Amen.
Why don't we pray right now and ask the Spirit to come and speak to us afresh. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing right now, just pause and just pray this simple prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. Would you fill me again with your presence? The presence of God. And for those of you wrestling with discernment, that question of do I stay on the track, on the road I'm on, or Lord, are you asking me to turn and take the road less traveled? If that's you, I pray right now, Lord, we want your will to be done, your kingdom come in that person's life. Would you graciously make it clear? Do they keep going or do they turn? But Lord, we trust, we know that we've not lost connection with you. Would you speak, Lord, and make it clear? And for all of us, would you show us, Lord, how we can play our part in seeing your kingdom come and your church built at HTBB and beyond. Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus is the one who saves us, who opens our eyes of faith, who unlocks the meaning of your scriptures. Would you give us the courage to obey you and to follow even on the road less traveled? And as we grow ever more into your likeness, Jesus, would you show us how we can practically serve and love those around us? Jesus, you said that you'd not come to be served, but to serve. You are the suffering servant king. Help us to put that into action as we choose to serve and love others. And we ask all of this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. If you'd like prayer for anything specifically right now, just click request prayer or continue to receive in an attitude of prayer as we worship together again right now.